they're going to be surprises for sure. I mean, the, 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 the most certain hallmark of collective intelligence is that they surprise you. That's, <laughs> that, you know, that's, that's the most obvious thing. But you hope that you discover the key surprises during testing. That, that's what all the testing is for. Uh, called the endless forms most beautiful 2.0 right it's darwin darwin had this phrase and he was like really impressed with a variety of living things that he saw in the natural world this is an n of one you know this 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 phylogenetic tree on earth is an n of one basically we we are going to be it's a tiny if you if you plot out the space of of all possible uh bodies and minds that go with them everything we know about on earth is like a tiny little corner of that and there are just massively different creatures that we are going to have to deal with. Never, never mind what happens if, if we find life, you know, exobiological context outside the planet. Never mind that. We're going to be making aliens like you can't believe. That's, that's just, that's just, there's no, there's no getting around that. So. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video, I had great fun speaking with Dr. Michael Levin, principal investigator at Tufts University, whose lab studies anatomical and behavioural decision making at multiple scales of biological, artificial and hybrid systems. In the following discussion, we talk about regeneration, intelligence and synthetic living machines. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. So hi, Mike. Thank you very much for joining me today and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Well, I'm like super fascinated and excited to have you on today um, because your research is just fascinating and I have so many questions, possibly more questions for you than I have had for any of my other guests previously. So I'm sure we'll cover like a, a broad spectrum of very interesting topics today. Great. Yeah, let's let's do it. So I guess, yeah, we'll just jump straight into it. And the first topic I just kind of want to explore is this idea of regeneration and how, I guess, and, you know, if, if we lose a limb or we lose a finger, like from an evolutionary perspective, that might be seen as being um, kind of an unfit mm -hmm. thing to not be able to regenerate or regrow um, different limbs. And obviously um, we have like wound repair systems and different approaches to dealing with, I guess, such stressful events such as a uh, loss of a limb. But I guess my first question is, what exactly is regeneration? And how does regeneration fit onto like the tree of life and wh which organisms do possess this ability? Yeah. So, so uh, I, I'll tell you what I know about regeneration in general, and then maybe I can, I can float an idea for what I think it really is, because I think it's a little different than, um, than how a lot of people think about it. So <clears throat> regeneration is uh, sprinkled uh, pretty, uh, pr pretty capriciously ac across the tree of life. Uh, there are, you know, oftentimes people think that uh, some like uh, uh, so-called simple systems regenerate and then more advanced ones don't. It's really not like that. There are there are very similar species where some of them regenerate and others don't regenerate anything. So it's kind of it's it's quite unclear actually why it comes and goes. Some species like Planaria regenerate everything. Um, even small pieces will regenerate an entire worm. Some <clears throat> species like um, Salamanders, they will regenerate uh, appendages, eyes, uh, limbs, uh, heart, uh, portions of the brain, um, spinal cord, ovaries. Uh, some mammals do interesting things. So, so, for example, deer regenerate their antlers. So deer will regenerate a, a centimeter and a half of new bone per day when they're growing their antlers, which is like this amazing uh, amount of bone and vasculature and innervation and skin. Um, and, you know, humans, of course, regenerate their liver and, and things like that. So uh yeah regeneration is uh it's it's un it's really unclear uh w why some species regenerate and some don't i i can i can tell a couple of interesting stories about it one thing that people sometimes think is that the reason that long-lived species like us don't regenerate is because it carries a cancer risk right so the idea would be that uh, if your body has access to some sort of highly plastic proliferative cell types, then you that you can you know that that can that can increase the odds of cancer during a long lifetime. So that that view, when you think about it from the bottom up in terms of cell cycle checkpoints and and genetic damage and things like that, would predict that animals with the best regenerative ability would have the highest levels of cancer. And in fact, the, the, the reality is the exact opposite. Animals that are good regenerators have very low cancer. And there are all kinds of uh, uh, examples of normalization where for a salamander or a planarian that does get cancer, you induce regeneration and that process basically clears it up and normalizes the cells and, and you know, you're back to normal. So I think the better way to look at it is if, if, if you don't, if you, if, if the body does not have very strong anatomical control, so the ability for 
cellular collectives to know what it is that they should be building and, and to build it, then you are going to be both not very regenerative and prone to cellular defections like cancer. So I think, and, and I think what we're really looking at when, when we talk about regeneration, I don't think it is some special capacity that sort of evolved as an add-on to, to help you survive injury and stuff like that. I think it's, it's the consequence of an incredibly basic fundamental thing of, of um, multicellular life. And in fact, even unicellular animals can regenerate, which is uh, uh, anatomical homeostasis. The idea that you, that, that, that you solve problems in anatomical sp morphous space, meaning that <clears throat> you start out at one type of configuration and you're trying to get to a particular region of anatomical morphous space, which is that, that target morphology for your species, whatever that might be. And li living things being very good, homeostats have all kinds of tricks to get to where they're going, despite perturbations like mutation, like injury, like uh, teratog you know, teratogens, all of that. So I think that um, regeneration is actually the basal state. And I think that, for example, embryonic development is a kind of regeneration in that, in that what happens from the perspective of every developmental stage, the prior stage is really a birth defect and it needs to be fixed. So from the, from the perspective of being a gastrula, the blastula is all wrong. And so what will happen is the blast, there's, a, there's a remodeling event that takes a blastula. And so I, I, have, this, I have this model where, uh, there's a there's a there's a stress driven um, set of uh, set of homeostatic uh, uh, processes, which are basically trying to reduce the delta between what you think you should what 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 the what the pattern should be, which is encoded in a particular bioelectrical state, which we can talk about bioelectricity too. And 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 that delta, you know, as soon as you've you've remodeled yourself and you've reduced that delta, and now you're a particular stage, that bioelectric pattern has meanwhile moved on. So now you're wrong again, and now you have to remodel again. And it sort of basically pulls you stage by stage through a set of regenerative events that uh, eventually and eventually every you know everything sort of uh, flattens out in, in in adult in adult patterning at least for for most animals and so yeah that's what i think i think regeneration is very fundamental it's a it's a basic homeostatic control loop well yeah that's a really interesting viewpoint and to kind of just i guess go a bit further with the idea about how um there isn't maybe an, an increased cancer risk having this regenerative potential, then why is it, you know, with humans and other, I guess, the large organisms, do we see less of a regenerative potential? Like, it seems like a kind of, not, not a bad decision, but a bad evolutionary um, offense yeah. to have done something like that. No, so no, no one knows for sure, but I can tell a story that may or may not make sense. Um, of course, there are going to be trade-offs, all kinds of trade-offs. And so, so think about our ancestors. So let's say you're some sort of a primitive mouse-like creature running around the forest, right, back in the day, and somebody uh, bites your leg off. Now, unlike a salamander, there's a couple of major differences. Differ the, the first difference is that you're in dry air instead of water. So that means that you are uh, not able to drive the ion currents out of the, your wound epithelium that you would when you were, if you were aquatic most good regenerators are aquatic right and and being in water is a, and and this is this is one of the reasons one of our uh regenerative applications that we work on has to, has is these wearable bioreactors that provide an, an aqueous you know david kaplan's group works with us to make these aqueous bio um, um, micro environments for the for the wound because that's very important the other very important thing is that um you're going to try to put weight on it unlike a salamander which can sort of hang out buoyantly you, somebody bites your leg off and you develop some some delicate blastema cells at the wound, you're immediately going to be crushing them into the forest floor and putting weight on it. Uh, and so I, I can easily see between that and the fact that you might you're going to you might get infected and you're going to bleed out and, and you know, your whole life cycle is lifestyle is much faster than for, for, for um, amphibians. Um, I can easily see why evolution would take the trade off and say, let's just scar. But we won't get infected. We're not going to spend all that all that energy trying to re regenerate something that's just going to get wrecked and, and infected. But just scar and infl get inflamed, scar. Hope we don't we don't you know catch a terrible infection and, and see if we can you know live live through this. So that's 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 the story that I think makes sense. And of course, no one knows for sure. Yeah, I mean that does kind of make sense to me as well. But you've already brought up kind of like where I was heading um, in my thought process with the questions which is this idea about these wearable um, biosensors, these biodomes, I believe you call them. Um, and you've done uh, experiments in particular with frogs called Senapus, where you've amputated their limbs and you've got them to wear these biodomes and you can see um, regeneration of their limbs. 
and not only that but they're also potentially functional as well and this paper I believe came out earlier this year um, and I was just wondering if maybe you could elaborate a bit more about what these these biodomes actually are and how they're functioning. Yeah, yeah. Um, we actually had a couple of papers on this. There was one in 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 well, there was a there was a, an earlier one uh, in 2018, and then and then there was this one that just came out. The idea is this: we we are we are very interested in uh, morphogenesis as a collective intelligence. So we're interested in not micromanaging the process and uh, let's say 3D printing a bunch of stem cells into a very particular structure. We're interested in understanding how the collective of the cells normally makes decisions about what it's going to grow, when it's going to grow and so on. And so our strategy, what, what we think should be possible is if, if, if these hypotheses are correct, what should be possible is to find high level triggers that don't sort of babysit the process and try to control everything that needs to happen to make an organ, but actually just shift the, 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 the set point for these cells and then let them do what they do best, which is to reduce error and to build to the set point. So activate that homeostatic process. So we, start, so we started looking for these, uh, for these high level uh, control, control structures. And I could tell you about others that we found by studying bioelectricity. So we make eyes and repairing brain defects and reprogram tumors. So we can talk about that separately. But for the leg thing, we basically found, uh, and this was, this was uh, back in 2010, we did. We did. Uh, we published some work showing that you can induce tail regeneration. Now, tails are cool because they have spinal cord and muscle and so on. So we showed that we can induce tail regeneration uh, just by one hour of application of this specific ionophore. So setting setting the bioelectric state of the wound uh, using a sodium ionophore, but just for one hour triggers all the downstream cascades, all the gene expression, cell movement, uh, the, all all, the, all that stuff. So we looked for the same. Th we we used the. Um, uh, the same uh, kind of, uh, we, we use the same kind of cocktail and, and some different ones. And the idea was in order to trigger it, you need really two things. You need an environment to convince those cells that it's safe to regenerate, right? So you need some sort of uh, very controlled, closed environment that's almost like amniotic, almost like a limb bud, you know, um, <clears throat> and that they would be able to signal to each other and not get washed out in the, in the bath and so on. And then, and then you need the payload, which is the signal, the drugs that, that cause the signal, right? The, 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 so the biodome is the delivery method and it's the environment, but now you need to have some kind of a drug in there that will activate them. And so we're, we're working on a variety of, uh, and by, by the way, I have, to, I have to do a disclosure. So David Kaplan and I are um, co-founders of a company called Morphoceuticals Inc. So, so Morphoceuticals is, is all about taking what we've learned in the frog and moving it into into mammals so we're doing experiments in mice now and then hopefully clin you know clinical work at some point so so every you know i have to I have to do that that disclosure and there's a commercial interest here so the idea so so the idea is that um we uh, david's group created the biodome the biodome is filled with an aqueous gel that's made of silk and that gel has uh various other drugs that that, that we put in there it's put on the amputation wound for uh, 24 hours just, just one day. That's it. Twenty four hours, and then you take it off, and you don't touch the animals again. And leg grows over a year and a half. So you wow. get a year and a half of leg, right? So, so there's a few amazing things I think about about this. Number one, animals that normally do not regenerate their legs as adults, in fact, can be made to regenerate their legs as adults, right? There's, that's even possible. It wasn't known before that that's possible. So it's possible. Number two. Uh, it's a very modular effect. In other words, we didn't intervene with the finely shaped gradients for a year and a half. We did nothing after the first 24 hours, the animal did everything, okay? So, so it's a very, it's a trigger. It's not, um, it's not, it's not a micromanagement type of situation. Number three, um, <clears throat> in that trigger, uh, we didn't even have to specify what organ we wanted. The, the, the trigger cocktail is very generic. In fact, we've done the exact same thing to make tails as it was to make, to make legs. It's literally a make whatever belongs here signal. It's not make a leg. So, so you never get, in, in, on a leg amputation, you never get a, an eye or a tumor or a tail or a, you know, anything else. You always get what belongs to the leg. <clears throat> so it's a very context sensitive process. We're not forcing the cells. We're communicating to them that they should make whatever it is that they already know goes there. The last, and, the, and then the last kind of amazing thing about it is that this cocktail, that was the first one we tried. It wasn't cocktail 78 wow. out of like 300 cocktails that we tried. We didn't have, I mean, originally, one of the limitations of this work is originally, I, I foolishly thought that this was going to be a rapid screening process that we could use before, you know, and it's, 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 it's not rapid by any means. And so we only got to try one cocktail. 
but the one cocktail we tried was amazing. And so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't believe in luck. And so to me, that's, that, that suggests that it's not that we just happen to have uh, somehow have lucked out onto the best cocktail in the world. Once we optimize this thing, we're really going to see uh, remarkable outcomes. This is just, uh, this is our first guess at it. You know, this is just our first step. Yeah, no, that really is quite incredible. And you've just raised a couple of questions in my head. Firstly, it's like, how soon do you have to intervene after you've like induced the damage? And like, yeah, is there like, yeah. because I guess you have to uh, quickly maybe induce the pattern before you suppress like the the more like scarring of the tissue. And then secondly, what was the rationale behind the decision of the drugs that you used? Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know when is the latest that you can do it. We don't know. In older work in the tail, we did investigate this, and we find out that we find out that even after the tail wound forms, what what in for the frog is the equivalent of a of a wound of a scar. So it's basically like this thick non permissive epithelium. Even after that, it still works. I have a feeling that in mammals, what you would have to do is you would have to recut. So if somebody had if somebody had a limb loss ten years ago and everything's healed over. I think you're going to have to reopen the wound, then put on the biodome and then go from there. That's my guess. We don't know, but that's, that's, that's what I think. Um, the, uh, the choice of the choice of drugs. So in previous work, we had done a few things. We, we had, we had, uh, tested a couple of bioelectric interventions, which are kind of the thing my lab focuses on. Um, we've also done progesterone. The 2018 paper was about progesterone. And that was because uh, the postdoc at the time, uh, Celia Herrera Rincon, wanted to go upstream and try to find something that triggers not only the right bioelectrical signal, but various other changes in the animal that that might be pro regenerative. So she went with progesterone and it was and, and that was shockingly effective. But right? the new the new cocktail, which is even better, has a number of ingredients, which, again, not specifically bioelectric this time. Now we're doing a bunch of bioelectric stuff next. But this particular one had things like, you know, it had a, it had it had a, a neurotrophic factors in it and it had growth hormone and it had retinoic acid, which is a positional information molecule for 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 the limb. And it had um, a, uh, uh, kind of a, a, a resolve in, uh, you know, so, 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 so pro pro wound resolution kind of, kind of molecule and so on. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a mix, a mix of things that we thought would, would convince the cells that it's time to regenerate as opposed to, you know, as opposed to scar and yeah, it worked really well. And I mean, I can't wait to, to, to get to try all the different uh, improvements that you can imagine right after the first trial. Yeah, for sure. And I think you already sort of mentioned it, but as you say, you have the bioreactor on for 24 hours and then it takes like a year for it to regrow the limb. And so in terms of scalability, it's quite hard to maybe, I guess, scale up and try different interventions. But I guess given the remarkable result from doing your first approach, then that, I guess, gives a lot of promise for identifying um, yeah, better and better combinations as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point, at this point, uh, we're in mice now. We're doing it in mice now. But I think uh, there's probably not. Uh, well, if I mean, if, if resources were unlimited, I would, there's still frog things to be done. But 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 given given how long that takes and, and limited resources, we're just going for mice at this point, um, which which also, you know, which also take a little bit of time. I mean, I, you know, in the end, in terms of clinical uh, clinical um, uh, kind of import, look, uh, a, 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 a five-year-old's arm is very usable, right? You can write, you can shave, you can you can eat, you can do whatever you're going to do. So if somebody if somebody in their twenties loses an arm in an accident somewhere, and you think that okay, five to seven years later, you have an arm that you can you can type and you can do everything with, that's pretty good. That's a good deal. Mm. Even if even if it you know even even if even if it grows no faster than a typical arm, you know a kid's a kid's arm is very usable. So I think I think in the end, even worst case scenario, I think it'll be fine. Yeah, for sure. And like in terms of, I guess, as you mentioned, translating it to humans, what kind of like criteria or like tick list of achievements do we need to see before we actually start giving it uh, as a human therapeutic? Well, there's a there's a long road. I mean, lots of lots, lots and lots of basic research needs to happen. Right. So I, I, I don't want to give the idea that we're sort of ready to start testing it on humans because we're absolutely not. Um, fundamentally, there's a number of things. I mean, a just to show in mammals that we can deal with all of the things that are different, you know, the blood pressure, the, the, the infection risk, the more complex, uh, you know, um, inflammatory response, the bigger, 
the bigger uh, diameter of the of the of the of the limb itself. You know, all of these things have to be have to be dealt with. Um, some things will be easier. You know, humans won't be chewing off the the biodome the way the mice try to do. So so certain you know certain things will be will be easier. But but there's a, there's a lot there's a lot that remains still. But uh, you know, uh, we're we're on the way. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and one thing that I think is kind of intriguing about this approach is, as you sort of mentioned, it's the idea that we don't necessarily need to fully understand the downstream molecular details of exactly how it's coordinating it. We just have to like intervene, I guess, at a higher level. And the reason that I, I think that's interesting is because there's a lot of, I guess, interest at the moment in terms of like personalized genomic approaches to healthcare. And I guess um, this approach, at least, at first glance appears to, to be something that might be more universal and maybe the same set of treatments could be applied more broadly and I guess do you think that's the case or do you think there would still be an element of like personalization uh to what like the drug combination could be there there, there is there is going to be an element of personalization only because uh in particular with the bioelectric treatments you're going to want to know in your particular patient, which channels are expressed in the wound, and that may differ somewhat person to person. We'll, we'll find out. But but you're right, fundamentally, in that this is a much more generic approach for the following reason. In any control structure, the further up you go, the less you have to worry about the details, because the whole point of a hierarchical control structure is that the details are delegated. So if, if, you, know, if you tell seven different people, um, you know, uh, go get me a coffee. They may do it completely differently, but and you don't. But the point is, you don't need to uh, specify. Well, you're going to move your right foot three inches this way. Then you're going to. You don't need to do any of that because you're dealing with competent agents that know how to do certain things, and you don't have to worry about it. your message is exactly the same. Even though in each person, the molecular details, right, of what they hear, how they carry it out, what what chemicals go where in their brain when they hear it, those are all different. But but you're up at a higher level, and so it's. Uh, addressing addressing these kinds of things at higher levels has lots of advantages um and one one of the advantages is that by 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 taking advantage of the fact that you're working with a competent material that already knows how to do things you can leave a lot of the details uh up to the implementation so so you're not going to uh have to worry about which which channels are open when you're going to set a set of bioelectric states and let let the system go from there that that i think you know that that part is going to be the same for everybody and and then and then different very very different things will, will happen downstream sure yeah that that makes sense um and just one kind of last aspect whilst we're talking about regeneration still is um and contrasting that to the the more wound healing and scarring approach is that one of my interests is in i guess the circadian rhythm and how there seems to be some differences in I guess like the downstream processes at different times of the day and in particular with wound healing I know that there is like a, an emerging area of research showing that depending on the time of the day when the wound occurs like the healing process can occur at different speeds yeah. and so I was just wondering if you've looked at all into any of the time of day links with these regenerative approaches. It's a fascinating question uh, you're right and and even for, for example now they're finding that for chemotherapy it uh, it really depends when you get it because because the cycling of the stem cells and also of the cancer cells is related to uh, the, the the time of day and so on. Uh, we don't we don't know very much about it. We're studying it. There's a there's a uh, there's a postdoc in the group who's studying time timekeeping in the context of a of a DARPA project on on slowing biological time for injuries and stuff like that. And so so she's working on this, but we we don't know much about it yet. It's still early days. Okay, cool. Well, I guess I'll look forward to seeing some of that research much then. Uh, so I thought next week should probably talk about something that we've actually mentioned a few times already, which is this idea about bioelectricity. And so I was just wondering if you could actually just explain more generally what is meant by this concept and how it differs to guess what I initially studied, which is like biochemistry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's think of it this way. I, I, I like to start like this. One of the most amazing parts of uh, the most amazing aspect of of multicellularity is the ability of cells to work together towards large scale goals so what i mean by that is uh if you have a salamander and you cut off the arm the cells will work together to rebuild the arm and then they stop how do they know when to stop when do they stop they stop when a correct salamander arm is finished 
So what you can say is and not, not because of magic, but because of cybernetics and, and this, uh, this idea that, you know, we understand now thermostats and other things. It's, it's, uh, there are certain devices are, are able to minimize error to some specification. So what the cells will do is they will continue to, to remodel and grow and do whatever until the error, the delta between the current state and the target state is, is as small as possible. Right. And that's the same thing for regulative development and the same thing for metamorphosis and other types of remodeling and so on. So if you're going to have a system where uh, lots of subunits are working together on a common goal that's much larger than themselves. So no individual cell knows what a finger is or can measure the length of the arm, right? Individual that's too big for an individual cell to deal with. But the collective absolutely minimizes delta from having the right number of fingers, having an arm of the right size, of the right shape and so on. So if you're going to do that, you need two things. Uh, you need a some mechanism for coordinating the cells, so binding them together towards common purpose in some fact, some informational structure. And B, you need to be able to store the set point, right? So the reason your thermostat works is because somewhere there's a it stores what the right range is, and when the temperature gets too low or too high, it'll kick it back. It'll it'll take action to try and get back into that range. So the key, th those kind of homeostatic processes only work when you can store a set point. Now this is already we, we've already left the realm of typical molecular biology, you know, sort of paradigm because normally what you hear is that well the genes get expressed they sort of roll forward under rules of chemistry and 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 maybe some biomechanics and and whatever you get that's what you get it's emergence right it's this idea of local simple rules and then something wondrous emerges out at the end but it's actually it's actually not I mean, and that's true that does exist but in addition to that you have these very interesting feedback loops that are not just forward emergence they they solve problems for example if you have an animal that has too many cells or too few cells or you intervene in various ways, much of the time it'll still find some way to make the right thing. And I could tell you the way that some amazing examples of this that are that are just incredibly impressive. So, um, so, so, so what is the computational medium that underlies all this? And one of the things that immediately strikes people as weird about this way of thinking about it is how, how, how is a collection of cells going to bind itself to have a memory of what it's supposed to do and cooperate as a kind of collective intelligence, right? That just sounds, sounds implausible. Until you remember that, well, we are all collective, you and I are collective intelligences, right? We are a bag of neurons. And in some way, those neurons work together to produce a centralized being that has memories, goals, preferences, and these kinds of things that don't belong to any of the individual cells. They belong to the collective. So, so we already know that does exist. That, that whole process happens between your ears all the time. So now one might ask, okay, how does that happen? Well, it seems that electrical networks seem to make that possible, right? That's not controversial. That's what neuroscience studies. So one can ask the next question, which is, okay, where did that come from? Did brains, uh, did brains suddenly like evolve this trick? And it turns out that all of the mechanisms, but also the algorithms for doing that are way older than brains. They exist in our unicellular ancestors. They were evolved around the time of bacterial biofilms. And so evolution noticed a very long time ago that electricity was a great way to store information, to make decisions, to um, coordinate information across spatial distances, to make computational networks, right? Bacteria already know this. So uh, what we study in my group is exactly that. Uh, this, this basic question of what did bodies think about before, before they had brains that could think about three-dimensional space? So brains are really good at thinking about clever behavior in 3D space. So controlling your muscles to move you around in 3D space and hopefully have some sort of intelligence, uh, you know, in the in the behavior. Right before that, that that that's an evolutionary pivot. Before that, that whole that exact same system, electrical networks of cells, were used to store information and navigate through a space. But it wasn't three dimensional space; it was morphous space. It was the space of anatomical configurations. So whereas now the collective intelligence of your neurons in your brain moves you through 3D space. Before, that same trick was used to move the collective intelligence of, of embryonic cells through morphous space, through anatomical space. And before that, it was used to move individual cells through um, physiological space. And before that, probably metabolic space. That's most likely how it went. And so, so evolution is just reusing the same amazing trick. And, and bioelectricity is really great at, at this. So, so basically almost everything that we know about neuroscience holds outside of the nervous system. It's not, in, in fact, in fact, none of the, one of the reasons why, why we've made progress 
is that the tools of neuroscience don't distinguish neurons from non-neural cells. They, they can't tell the difference. They work in every cell. And so that, that tells us something very important about this, this distinction we have between neuroscience and, and, and other fields. It's a, it's a man-made distinction. Nature doesn't, doesn't support that. So um, all these other cells, what they're doing is they use the same tricks. They have ion channels. So they form a voltage gradient across the membrane. Uh, they have gap junctions, which are electrical synapses. These are precursors of modern um, chemical synapses. They have neurotransmitter, mach neurotransmitter machinery and neurotransmitters move under the, this, this electromotive uh, force and so on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so this, so this uh, uh, we, what we've been studying is we, we develop tools, basically appropriated tools from, from, from neuroscience and applied those tools and concepts to ask uh, to read and write this electrical information in, in morphogenesis to ask what does the collective intelligence uh what does it measure what does it remember how does it bind together and can we rewrite it and the answer is yes we can we can actually rewrite this information now yeah it's extremely interesting and like I, I think you're right i mean you can really look back and look at bacteria and i was going to mention like mitochondria as well and how see the what I learned from teaching the students is how we have the proton pumping that drives, I guess, ATP synthesis. And so I, I know as well, like neuronal signaling, which is kind of like the canonical introduction to electrochemical signaling um, or electrical signaling, but then um, the body and how you have uh, potassium and sodium moving as well as calcium, I guess. And so what are like the major, um, like, I guess, components that have this charge that are moving across the channels? Yeah, it depends. It depends on the cells and the tissues and the species, but basically all of the ions, chloride, um, you know, uh, protons, uh, potassium and sodium, all of these things move across the across the membrane and they establish a voltage gradient. And it's the it's the spatial pattern of voltage gradients that is interpreted by the cells as as information. And it, and it, and it almost doesn't matter. In fact, most of the cases that we look at, it doesn't matter what ions were used to get there. Right. And that's something we do in, in, in all of our papers is we show you can get the exact same effect by altering potassium, sodium, chloride, protons, as long as you get them moving in the right direction so that you get the voltage change that you wanted. Right. So you have to calculate that out, which how do you how do I what are the different ways I can get the voltage change? And again, it gets back to this idea that we just talked about, about a high level control. So voltage is a voltage is a macro state. Right. It's like it's 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 you, you get to a certain voltage by many different combinations of sodium potassium concentrations. So it's not, it's not that, ooh, this particular ion channel gene and this particular level of sodium is what caused my morphogenetic event. It's the voltage state that caused your event. And many different microstates are compatible with that. It's like temperature, right? It's like, you know, Boyle's law. You're talking about a boiler. You've got, you've got this notion of temperature or pressure, and there's many, many different microstates underneath that, but you don't care because, because to control that, that, that uh, you know, that, that, um, uh, that that device, you, the, the the operant variable is is temperature or pressure. <clears throat> I see. So okay, I see. So in terms of like how you would study this in the lab, like what kind of like approaches can you use to identify the different voltages? And do you feel like um, the tools have improved over the last decade or so, and it's making it easier to do these kind of experiments now? Yeah, yeah, the tools, uh, the tools are getting better. Um, what we use, so, so, so here, here are the things we use. Uh, to read the voltages, we use voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes. There are, there are also genetically encoded reporters, which are improving all the time. People are making these, um, you know, variants of GFP and other things that, uh, that, that, that fluoresce differentially based on the voltage. Um, and then, and then, of course, you have the dyes. They're getting better. There's, there's tons of room for improvement, though. So one of my, one of my real goals is to work with chemists to make better, better dyes, so that we have better maps of voltage. Um, one of the reasons that uh, bioelectricity has lagged for years behind biochemistry and genetics is that you can, you can kill a cell, fix it with alcohol or formaldehyde, take out the, 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 the gene, the, the genetic, take out the genetic material, take out the proteins, the RNA and isolate them and study them. And that's great. The, all the bioelectrics disappear the moment the cell is dead, right? You can't, you can't do any of that. You have to study it in a living state, which means that all of this, this, this molecular bioelectricity, um, which, which of course rests on many decades of, of work by, by, uh, you know, sort of the forefathers of this field, which used electrodes and, and other things, but, but the molecular bioelectricity, um, 
it, it, it's only possible now that we have these in vivo, these amazing, uh, you know, fluorescent and other techniques where you can do this stuff in vivo. So, so the key techniques are, of course, tracking the voltage. But then the other, the other thing you really want is the functional experiment. You want to rewrite the voltage. So the way you do that is, so, so really important, no electrodes, no fields, no waves, no magnets, no electromagnetic radiation, none of that. Um, what we're doing is molecular physiology. So specifically opening and closing ion channels and gap junctions. Now that might be with pharmacology. It might be by mutating them. It might be by introducing new channels or knocking down channels or um, using optogenetics, for example, we, can, we, we we've we've shown that you can use light gated channels to 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 control quite precisely. Um, that's yeah, those those kind of tools. I see. Yeah, and um, you already sort of mentioned what I was going to ask you next, which is about how um, a lot of the iron movement is regulated by different channel proteins. And at least from what I remember from undergrad, things like I guess GPCRs, although I'm not entirely sure how many of them are like iron uh, channel regulators, but a lot of the membrane proteins are quite druggable. Like they're on the surface, they're easier to target through, I guess, a variety of different means. So I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's a good thing for developing, yeah, therapeutics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can think of these, these ion channels on the surface of tissues are the interface that this hardware is exposing to you as a, as a bioengineer or a regenerative medicine worker to control the system. And luckily, yeah, some, something like, I think, I think I read like 20% of all drugs are ion channel drugs. And so it's a very, uh, you know, a very good way to, uh, with, with, with great specificity. The, th the thing is, of course, that like with any interface, the downstream effects of specific perturbations are complex. So you don't know exactly what's going to happen until you've understood the electric circuit and modeled it. So you might, for example, shut down a particular potassium channel. Well, there may be seven other potassium channels that will open and close in, in to, to compensate for that because the cell is fighting you on, on, on in your attempts to change the voltage. So it's a, it's a much different, it, it isn't like, um, you know, I'm going to knock down this transcription factor and that's it. Now, now it's, now it's gone and now whatever, genes it was supposed to turn on now they now they're off it's it isn't like that it's a it's very much um you know it's interacting with a complex computational device and giving it inputs and and, and the key is which we've tried to develop is to have a uh, a commutational model that predicts what's going to happen and that you can invert so that you can say okay but i want this to happen so now which channels do i open and close yeah i guess yeah that is really is a challenge and in terms of like thinking about applying it in vivo in terms of the different cell types and how you have like stem cells you have cancerous cells and I guess what I study is senescent cells like I mean I guess I can look at the gene expression changes and I can see that there are differences in the iron channel expression and so can you therefore use like the voltage of a cell to be able to identify like, like for example a senescent cell is that potentially possible? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so what you what you uh, what you can get, and and by the way, tons of physiomics still needs to be done. Okay, so so we don't. So, for example, senescent cells. I have no idea if senescent cells have a different profile than normal cells. However, what you can definitely tell is uh, stem cells, embryonic cells, and tumor cells tend to be quite depolarized, uh, terminally differentiated adult uh, normal, you know, somatic cells tend to be hyperpolarized. Now. That's fine, and that can be useful. For example, we have a cancer diagnostics um, kind of uh, application where you can use that to to look for a signature of of, of precancer, right? Look for depolarized cells. But I want to be I want to be very clear. In fact, in fact, so so I have this beautiful diagram which shows voltage from you know minus eighty all the way to zero, and it shows so all the cancer cells cluster down here, and the stem cells are down here, and the you know normal cells are up here. People people love to see that diagram. I've stopped showing it in talks because because people focus on that and it sounds like a neat story and, and it is, but the problem is that's a single cell story. And this is not fun to, none of this is fundamentally a single cell phenomenon. So I, I don't want people to be thinking about, ah, this cell has a particular voltage, therefore it's this type of cell, therefore problem solved. All of the big problems in this field are not about single cells having their own voltage. It's about large groups of cells reading the voltage of themselves and other groups of cells it's a network phenomenon so zooming into individual cells i mean there's certainly applications for that but i don't think that's fundamentally what the bioelectric system is about it isn't about single cell states it's about anatomical decisions yeah i see and i guess as kind of on from that 
or at least with like neuronal signaling, I guess if you looked at the voltage, it varies, right? It gets hyperpolarized and it depolarizes. And so it's not just necessarily about looking at the, I guess, the average um, voltage, but I guess there might be fluctuations in the the frequency in which they they change or like like the, I don't know, the dynamics of the voltage. Yeah, I think I think the nervous system uses uh, temporal encoding more than than other cells do. We don't know, quite frankly, we haven't really dug deeply enough into uh, the temporal uh, properties of other cells. But I, if from what we know right now, if I had to guess, I would say that the majority of your body tissues use spatial encoding, so spatial differences in resting potential whereas the brain really likes uh, that kind of spiking temporal encoding but i'm sure the it, it bleeds over in both directions you know okay that's cool i said so kind of keeping with i guess bioelectricity still um there was a really cool study that came from out from your lab that uh, was with planarians and he put them in barium solution which i believe is like a non-specific inhibitor of some ion channel and what that did was it prevented them forming their heads or something and so you left them in the solution and, and then over time they got this ability to actually make their heads again and I don't know if I completely bluffed your article but I was wondering if you could explain that in a bit more detail sure sure so okay so so the basic observation was this you take you, you you're absolutely right uh, barium is a non-specific potassium channel blocker so you take your worms and you put them in a the barium solution and uh, overnight, their heads explode. I mean, their heads literally, it's called head deprogression. Their heads are just, wow. just, just because, because there are all these neurons in there and they can't handle not being able to exchange potassium. So there's massive cytotoxicity, the cells die. So you got, this, you got this back half of the worm and you leave it in the barium. And what you find out is that after a couple of weeks, they regenerate a new head perfectly. And the new head doesn't care at all about the barium, no problem. And so you ask yourself, well, how is this possible? How are these heads uh, now surviving barium, right? So we did, we did a very simple minded experiment and it was sort of, it, 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 it's clearly not the only thing to do because no one said that the difference has to be transcriptional, but the, we, we, the tool was there, so, so we did it. We basically just did um, next gen sequencing and did a transcriptomic analysis of what makes, and just subtracted, like what makes the barium adapted heads different from normal heads. Yeah, which just transcriptionally, what makes them different? Yeah, and uh, and what we found is that there's only a handful of there's only a handful of genes that 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 enable them to be barium adapted. So now the important thing about all of this is 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 this. Think think about this. Planaria never see barium in the wild. There's never been evolutionary pressure to deal with barium. So it's complete because because they don't see barium in the wild. So so it's unlikely that they have a, a, an evolved response of here's what we do when, when, when we're hit with barium. Instead, think of the problem that these cells have to solve. You have tens of thousands of genes. It's a little like I always imagine it being in the middle of a nuclear reactor control room and the thing's melting down and you don't know what you, know, you, what you don't have time to do because planarian cells don't uh, turn over the way bacteria might. You don't have cells, you don't have time to just try combinations. You don't have time for gradient descent or just randomly flipping with, you know, genes up and down. You don't have time for that. Uh, somehow you have to figure out which of my transcriptional uh, effectors, my, my, my transcriptional actions that I can take are going to resolve this completely novel physiological stressor. That's a really interesting problem it, 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 anywhere in any other space, we would be calling it intelligence, right? If you, if you had a device that was, uh that was designed to 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 solve certain kinds of problems and you gave it a novel problem and then figure out how to solve it using the tools that it had you would say well that's a that's a cool example of intelligence i mean that's what intelligence is right it's t- using what you know to solve new problems um it, it's yeah it's an amazing thing and and we we don't really know how it works i mean i have a i have an idea but uh but we don't really know how it works and i think this is just the tip of the iceberg i think cells are incredibly good at dealing with, uh, with cells and cellular collectives because of that multi-scale competency architecture they have a really um remarkable ability to to, to deal with novelty thank you yeah thank you for explaining that in a bit more detail and i think as well in that study um you then put them back into water and then back into barium and then they had lost the ability and so um, what does that tell us about the memory of the system? Is the memory expensive? And so maybe as you say, they, they're not used to, to barium, then it, they were like 
well, not, I don't know how to explain it, but they, they were like, it's not adaptive to waste this energy storing some memory of this offense if it's unlikely to happen again. That's what, yeah, that's entirely possible. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is imagine transcriptional space, which is obvious. It's, high, it's, it's a very high dimensional space, so it's impossible for us to visualize it. But, but imagine transcriptional space in that space. There's going to be an attractor that is the standard um, normal planarian way to have your genes expressed. And then there's going to be another attractor, a small one that works really well when you've been challenged by barium. So I think that uh, staying in that in that other attractor is probably, you know, when you're challenged, you sort of wander around and find that space and then you can regrow your head and life is good. But it may be that either it's expensive, as you say, energetically expensive, or it's just that dynamically that attractor is kind of shallow. And it's really easy to sort of fall out of it. And, and if you fall out of it, you probably go back to the big one, right? So you can imagine like this big, you know, this big bowl and next to it, there's like a little bowl and you're sitting in the little bowl and then, you know, everything is a little bit shaking. And, and so chances are eventually you're going to, unless there's pressure for you to stay there, you're probably going to eventually end up in the big standard attractor. So that's, so that's another way to think about that. To really understand this is going to have to wait until um, we're going to, we're going to do a single cell RNA seq and, just track the path of each animal in through that space to actually find out how they, how, you know, how they find the right region of, of transcriptional space. <clears throat> okay, that's super cool. And I think it was also speaking of memory and planarians, um, there was a study you did as well where you again perturbed the electrical network and you basically made the planarians have two heads. And this time, every time they kind of like I'm not entirely sure how they replicate, actually, but um, they kept the pattern of two heads. It's like they had somehow created this memory. And do you have any idea, like, you know, what, where is this memory being stored? Because the, the DNA is exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, we can we can see it. It's uh, it's stored. It's stored. There's an electrical circuit that um, is. Uh, my, my, it's you, you can think about it as. Um, as a piece of uh, as a piece of uh, RAM, it's basically a piece of electrically active memory. You can we can see that we can literally see the memory with, with this voltage dot. You can see where it says one head, and you can see how to change it to make it say two heads. And when you do that, the cells when they are injured, the cells will consult the memory. They say, ah, two, I guess a good planarian has two heads, and they'll build two heads. And that the 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 amazing thing about that circuit is that it uh, it keeps the memory. And it also there's a, there's another there's another tricky part of this which is which is uh, this kind of uh, planar polarity of the cell. So there's a there's a there's a, 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 a feedback between the bioelectrics, which is kind of like the short term memory, and then cytoskeleton organization in the cells, which which maybe you can think about as kind of a longer term memory. So both of those are affected, and uh, yeah, and, and 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 as a result, you have these uh, you have these tissues that just persist in this in this pattern. You can set it back. We can take a two-headed worm and make set it back to one-headed, but in the meantime, the the memory the memory holds basically. And you can do you can do, you can do another interesting trick with it, which is you cut you cut off their heads, and then you um, prevent the cells from communicating electrically. So you block the gap junctions basically with general anesthetic. It's the same thing that general anesthesia does. And when you do that, when you so forty-eight hours of that, you pull them out. And they will regain the, the electrical electrical network will regain an attractor, but it doesn't always find the right one. And so when that happens, it lands in a different one that belongs to a different species. So you will get planaria with heads that belong to different species. So so instead of the nice triangular head, you'll get flat ones, round ones, uh, ones that belong to other species, including the shape of the brain, the distribution of stem cells. Everything becomes like these other species. And uh, yeah, even though, as you say, even though the, the genetics is not edited. Yeah, that's incredible. And, and so what does this electrical memory then tell us about like how in our brains we record memories? Does that provide any insight at all? Yeah, I think, I think, I think you're onto something very important. Um, I, I do think that um, understanding how this works is going to do a lot of good for neuroscience because in neuroscience, there's a problem. You know, most people study memory, let's say, in synaptic um, you know, synaptic structures and synaptic plasticity, that whole story of, of memories being stored in synaptic, specific synaptic structures is kind of unraveling. There's a lot of reasons why that's probably wrong at this point. And um, I think that I think that trying to understand uh, how 
other kinds of memories are stored, such as morph morphological memories and so on, might actually put us onto the right thing. And I actually suspect, and this is, this is a total um, conjecture at this point from, for me, but uh, I suspect that actually cytoskeleton is going to be a really key part of this. And my guess is that this is just, again, my, my own guess is that neural networks are not there to store memories. They're there to interpret um, uh, engrams that are probably cytoskeletal. In, in, in nature. So I actually think that the, re, the real medium of storing them is going to be some, some uh, biochemical structure, probably cytoskeleton, maybe something else. And what the neural nets do is, is interpret it and reconstruct, uh, reconstruct memories on the fly by reading these, these chemical uh, cues as opposed to trying to store them. Wow. Yeah, no, that's super fascinating. In fact, like, I think I maybe did come across a review article like a year or so ago that had a similar kind of like idea. So this is definitely something that I'm like interested in just reading about and myself anyway so that's super cool um and so i guess like yeah speaking more about um memory and just like intelligence in general um and how like intelligence can be seen at, i guess like at different levels um and how you don't have to have like a brain and a you know multicellularity to have intelligence because you had an interesting study that came out uh, a couple of years ago maybe uh where you have something called cenobots where you just took some some cells and you uh i mean you're probably going to explain it better than i can but you were able to sort of get it to do different behaviors and show forms of intelligence and i was just wondering if you could explain a bit better than i have about that <laughs> yeah so so there's two there's two interesting pieces there um one one piece has to do with intelligence and then and then i'll uh, more broadly and then I'll, I'll talk about the xenobots um i want to i want to start with the intelligence part because I, I haven't specifically made any claims about um, what kind of intelligence the Xenobots have. That's still very much under investigation. But I want to I want to say something about intelligence first. Um, <clears throat> to me, here, here's a here's a proposed, and there are many, but here's a proposed definition of intelligence. And I, I, in, intelligence, I think, is uh, I, I like William James's intelligence it's definition of intelligence, which is the ability to get to the same goal by different means. So I think that's very powerful. And well, I would put two, two twists on that. I would say one is yes, and that goal can be stated in many different problem spaces. It's not just physical space, but it might be morphous space. It might be transcriptional space. It might be um, you know, linguistic space in the case of, uh, of, of advanced uh, you know, humans and whatnot, uh, transcri um, um, transcriptional space, physiological space. And your degree of intelligence is the competency with which you pursue the goals that you pursue. And your sort of cognitive sophistication is the size of the goals you're able to pursue, L literally the, the size in that space. So if you can only, if, if what stresses you out is being far from your goal of having the right local sugar concentration, you're probably a bacterium. If, what, if, if on the other hand, you're able to pursue a goal about the size of a human arm, you're probably a collection of cells making an arm. If your goal is um, you know, a particular quality of the earth's uh, financial markets and, and, you know, peace among men, you're probably a human that you can, con you can even work towards, uh, you can represent a goal of that size, right? Maybe, maybe one that's not going to be done in your lifetime. I and mean, that's an amazing thing that humans can do. So, so, so I have a very uh, functional generic view of intelligence. It, I, I don't think it matters what you're made of, how you got here, being evolved design. I don't think any of that matters. What matters is, are you a system that uh, can pursue different types of different scales of goals and how how competently do you pursue them do you get caught in local minim minima do you have um any kind of uh delayed gratification so you can go around boundaries to get where you need to be that kind of stuff so the reason that the reason that i think it's important to do that is people people often have these binary categories which i think are completely false and and really hold back progress people will say things like I, and maybe some apes, and maybe my dog, and maybe an octopus, and people fight about that, uh, we are true intelligences. This other stuff, well, that's just physics. That's just a metaphor. I mean, I can see the mechanisms, you know, the aplysia has this and that mechanism for, you know, uh, um, habituation, and that's just chemistry and physics. I have real intelligence. This is, of course, uh, impossible now that we, we know about evolution and, and developmental biology. We know that each of us took a very smooth journey from being a pile of chemical reactions in an oocyte, in an unfertilized oocyte, all the way up to being a human that's going to make claims about second order cognition and your true intelligence or whatever else you've got. 
every step along the way was nice and smooth. It was very slow. There was never a lightning bolt that said, boom, today you're, you're a cognitive being. Yesterday you were, a, you were, a, you were just physics. Much like in, in evolution, that never happened. You can, all, you can also start to roll back and ask yourself, whatever it is that you think you have, you know, moral cu- culpability and whatever, well, how about your ancestors of 200,000 years ago? Did they have it? Well, how about 4,000, 100,000 years ago, right? Well, how about, like, there's never a set of parents that were just, you know, sort of whatever, and then their offspring, bang, the offspring is now cognitive, right? That never happened. So we have to we have, to have this gradual view of, of, of intelligence, and we have to be able to recognize intelligence in unconventional embodiments. We're terrible at that. We're, we're only good, because all our sense organs point outward, we're only good at recognizing intelligence in medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds in three-dimensional space then we're good we can see you know the the monkeys hiding the you know the thing of water so then well, ah that's that's pretty smart and so okay but but if you had access to your blood like like if you had in in if you had conscious awareness of the the blood chemistry of, of your body at any given point and you knew what your what your liver was doing at any point in time you would be able to recognize that that organ as being very intelligent in physiological space you would just be able to that would be natural to you if we had senses like that which we don't so um so 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 i'm always interested in in problem solving and intelligence in weird unfamiliar spaces so now let's get to the to the xenobot business um much like uh let's just warm up for a second with it with this with this example um imagine uh newts newts have uh, these these little kidney tubules that lead that lead to their kidneys they are normally made from eight to ten cells in a if you take a cross section through the through the tubule eight to ten cells make this circle and inside there's a lumen and that's your tubule right what you can do is you can you can make polyploid newts that have more and more ends you know four n six n eight n and as you do that the cell size gets bigger and bigger so the first thing that's already amazing is, hey, wait a minute, with, 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 with extra copies of all the genetic material and you still make a normal newt, that's wild. But OK, that's one thing that the, 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 you know, uh, the, the software can make up for like additional copies of every, of every piece of information. That's amazing. Gets better than that. Uh, the newts are the same size. So that means that fewer and fewer cells have to be used to make the same tubule because the cells are bigger. Right. So if you have something that's made of, you know, 10 Legos and the Legos are now bigger, you have to use fewer of them to get the same thing. So that's kind of amazing. We're now this isn't just response to injury or response to environment. Your own parts are changing and you can make up for that. That's amazing. The most amazing part is that if you make the cells truly gigantic, such that only one cell fits, what happens is one cell wraps around itself, leaving a lumen in the middle. And you get your you get your your normal sized lumen with a completely different molecular mechanism. So instead of cell to cell communication that builds a normal tubule, now you have some sort of I don't know cytoskeletal bending that that drags a single cell around in a loop like that. So what that tells you is incredible problem solving on the part of this collective intelligence. Despite the changes in your very own parts, you can call up different molecular components to serve the same large scale anatomical need. It's a nice example of top down causation, actually, because it's the it's the anatomy that drives the molecular biology in this case. So um, so that's just an example of 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 cells. You know, it's kind of like I I often in my in my own head, I call call it play the hand you're dealt, like whatever you've got, you're going to figure out some way of making the best of it. Right. It's it's an amazing capacity. So we wanted to ask a simple question. about cells in terms of their plasticity and in terms of their um, ability to handle novelty. And we said this, uh, ima- imagine this, uh, you look at an embryo and you look at the skin and you say, what do these skin cells naturally want to do? What do they naturally do? And you might say, well, they naturally want to be this two dimensional layer on the outside of the animal and keep out the bacteria. It's pretty boring, but that's probably what they naturally want to do. Well, that's not what they naturally want to do because if you take those cells out of that context, and leave them on their own in a little pile, uh, liberate them from the instructive interactions with the, from the rest of the, of the cells, then you get to find out what they actually want to do when nobody's bullying them into being the skin layer. When you, what they actually want to do is, well, they could have done many things. They could have crawled apart from each other. They could have died, as some cells do when they're alone. They could have um, uh, made a flat monolayer, like a cell culture. Instead, what they do is they come together they form this little this little ball, and this, by the way, was all was all joint work with um, uh, Josh Bongard's lab. Uh, they form this little ball, uh, 
the little the the cilia these 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 moving hairs that they have on their surface that you, normally they're used to spread the um, the mucus down the the body of the frog they use those cells to row the the, the cilia they use them to row against the water and that thing starts moving around on its own so what what can they do they can do mazes they can um they can navigate all kinds of all kinds of shapes they can uh regenerate damage uh, they can the, the most amazing thing they can do is um if you if you if you sprinkle a bunch of loose cells in their environment they will go around and they will collect those cells into little piles like like bulldozers they'll sort of bulldoze them into little piles guess what those piles do those piles become the next generation of xenobots they start zipping around doing the exact same thing and on and on it goes that's kinematic self-replication right um it's kind of von neumann's dream of a machine that uh, that builds itself out of loose parts that it finds in the environment so the amazing so so again so, so here's what i think is amazing about it. and there's all kinds of practical applications of this that we can talk about but but more interesting than that i think is this there's never been selection to be a good xenobot where does the xenobot body plan and behavior come from because normally when you look at a creature and you ask why is it a certain shape a certain color why does it have behaviors it's easy you say oh a selection because it had a certain environment and everything that didn't fit that environment is dead. So that's why it has it. There's never been the Xenobots. There's never been selection to be a good Xenobot. Why do these cells know how to do this? Where does that come from? So it's, it's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that we've pushed is this idea that this is a new robotics and engineering platform. Not only does it tell us something interesting about the problem solving of these cells, like, Okay, now you're in a different environment. You're missing all the other cells that you're supposed to have. You can't reproduce in the normal froggy fashion. How are you going to do it? They figured out a new way to do it. Um, so there's all that, plasticity, basal cognition, there's all that, but it's also a new way of bioengineering because unlike normal engineering where you're working with passive materials, where you have to micromanage everything, you have wood and, 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 and copper and whatever else, you have to make sure that, that whatever you want to happen is gonna happen. This isn't like that. This is a, an agential material. The, the cells have agendas. They know how to do things and they want to do things. And the only way you're going to get this material to do something different is by providing appropriate inputs, stimuli, rewards and punishments, incentives, uh, you know, attractors, uh, attraction molecules, whatever you're going to give them. You're not micromanaging it. You're, it's like, it's like, um, you know, it's like building a tower out of, out of uh, cats instead of bricks. It's a completely different strategy, right? Instead of instead of putting them where you want, that doesn't work with cats. You have to do rewards and punishments so that you can, you know, sort of train them to do these circus tricks. So uh, that's you know we 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 create the the first generation of xenobots by manipulating the signals, the, the environment that that the cells get. They do the exact same thing to the next generation. The only reason this this reproduction works is because they're dealing with an agential material. Right? This wouldn't work with passive cells. Nothing would happen. It works because the cells they're working with already all, all, all want to do this too. And I think the other powerful thing about this is I think evolution does exactly the same thing. I think evolution is, 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 is mainly works by providing, because, because, because the material that evolution works with is, is, is already an agential material. It's not starting from scratch every single time. So, so what evolution does is it searches the space of the signals, the rewards, the whatever you have to give these cells to get them to do certain things. Like, hey, you're going to be in a, a two-dimensional layer on the outside of the of the tadpole. So I think I think it's an it it the, these these um, these xenobots, aside from all the practical stuff, they provide a new window on on problem solving, on origin of body plants, on evolution, on uh, on engineering, on the idea that you know evolution maybe doesn't build solution doesn't discover solutions to specific problems like here's a frog to a yeah, the, the, what does the frog genome actually know well it knows how to survive as a frog but apparently it also knows how to be a xenobot who, who knows what else it can do so right so so evolution makes problem solving machines it doesn't find specific solutions and that is interesting because it doesn't sit really well with this traditional picture of evolution as blind and short-sighted the idea is you know, normally, right? Evolution is supposed to always take the short-term payoff and it's supposed to be blind and whatever works now, that's what it takes. If that's were true, if, if that were true, why do we have these things that are so good at solving scenarios that never came up before? It's almost, you know, it, it, I mean, engineers do this because they have foresight, right? Because you try to make an, a, 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 you know, an autonomous vehicle or a robot or something that's going to handle multiple things in the future. Evolution is not really supposed to do that. 
So I think there are many, you know, many deep questions here. No, for sure. Like I, I yeah, I feel like we could talk all night about this. And it's like fascinating stuff. And so, like, yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, I had some questions about the intelligence which you mentioned uh, prior to this, but I guess we can stay with the Cenobots for now. And like, yeah, I mean, I guess in theory, then could you do the same thing with human skin cells and or different um, potential, uh, yeah, tissue cells? And then, um, what are the kind of potential applications? I guess in therapeutics, but beyond that as well, with using this new way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're I, you know, I can't give any details because it's not peer reviewed yet and everything, but, but I can, we, we're definitely doing it with other cell types. It's not anything to do with, with amphibians. It's not anything to do with being an embryo. It's a much more, it's a much more generic, much more generic phenomenon. Um, the applications uh, come in a couple of different flavors. One set of applications is useful synthetic living machines. So once we get better control and, and people, people have already said, well, why aren't you, you know, engineering them and you can put synthetic biology circuits in them and all this. of course we can, and we're going to, but the first three, and there's a couple more coming. The first few papers about this are all native because, because I don't want to this to be, well, well, okay, put some kind of circuit in it. And now it does X, Y, Z. And the point, the point is look at what these cells already know how to do with a wild type genome, right? That's, that's the point. And but but then of course after that you program them. So once you start, once you can, you, once you can program them with various mm, s s signals and stimuli, and 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 maybe we put in some 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 circuits and whatnot, bioelectrics of course. Um, then you can imagine useful machines. You could imagine them. Uh, you, you know they're cleaning up uh, the you know oceans. They're um, uh, searching for for rare maybe toxic molecules. They're doing sensing, rescue, exploration. Uh, micro sculpting organs for transplantation, you know, hydroponics, you can imagine a million different, a million different applications, then you can imagine applications in the body, right? So, so cleaning up arthritic knee joints, chasing down cancer cells or bacteria in, in the gut, uh, you know, fusing retinas back to, you know, where they belong, all that kind of stuff D down, you know, someday, someday in the future. But I think that that's only the first level. The second level is, can we use these bots as a discovery platform to learn the rules of morphogenesis. You see, one of the things we're not very good at, in fact, we're very really bad at, is understanding the scaling of goals. So when you make a collective intelligence system, be it swarm robotics or a group of cells or some kind of social or financial structure, whatever it is, what is the collective going to want? What are the goals of a collective? They're not linear functions of the goals of the pieces, that's for sure. And so we're not very good at predicting those. We're not very good at recognizing them. We're not very good at predicting them. And we're not no good at controlling them. So can we use the Xenobots and that, those kind of platforms as an agential material in which we can practice this new science of understanding the scaling of goals? And then, and if you can do that, then, for example, in biomedicine, you could, if you, if you could, if we get good at telling the Xenobot cells what to do, in terms of make a you know make a you know make a little make make a shape that looks like a little house or something right just just generic control over growth and form, then we'll be able to do that in vivo for birth defects, traumatic injury, um, aging, degenerative disease, cancer. In, having nothing to do with the bots themselves, we'll be able to control what other cells build. That that I think is is kind of the next level of applications, and and then of course the third level, which is sort of you know the most the most kind of philosophical of all, is 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 to use them as a platform to really dissolve a lot of our um you know a lot a lot of our binary categories that don't really exist but but we always thought they did because of, of kind of failure of technology and imagination we thought that there was a difference between machine and organism right people say that every every year somebody publishes a paper saying living things are not machines and and and, and you know and so they have these binary categories that are that just they just set up a bunch of pseudo problems that uh, are not compatible with the modern uh, capabilities of, of biology. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's honestly super fascinating. And I think just to go on from the applications of like the Cenobots or I guess like other potential uh, tissue type equivalents, um, if they are, as you say, like we, we don't fully understand this morphological space. And so if you're putting them in like for therapeutic use of going into the body, and then inside the body, there's like a different environments and different places. And like, how, like, would it not alter then like what that 
Sonia so Porter's doing? Like, I mean, it's maybe going to be adapting to different in, in novel environments. Like, I guess, how would you fix it? Like, which, once you've told it to do this, how would you ensure it stays like that and not start doing something else? Well, yeah, I mean, so so that's part of the testing, of course, right? So, so you have to test it in the environments in which you hope to deploy it. So you would have to test it in, uh, you know, let's say, let's say if you do have some sort of in the body application, you would have to test it in an in vivo model where they encounter that kind of environment and make sure that it's doing what, you know, what you think it's going to do. There are going to be surprises for sure. I mean, the, 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 the most certain hallmark of collective intelligence is that they surprise you. That's, <laughs> the, you know, that's, that's the most obvious thing. But you hope that you discover the key surprises during testing. That, that's what all the testing is for. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess, yeah, speaking more about this collective intelligence, like what does that that mean in terms of the ethics? Like if there's intelligence at different levels and how, you know, the, I do a lot of in vitro cell culture work and I'm like technically, you know, they have intelligence. I mean, I can see it when I passage them, they're growing, they're responding to what I, the drugs I give them. What is, yeah, what are the ethical implications of all of this? There are massive ethical implications, but but they're not quite, I think, what people think they are. One thing we can note for sure already with the majority of us, I mean, certainly there are vegans and Jains and things like this, but, but the majority of us in the society uh, are perfectly okay uh, eating highly intelligent animals, right? So pigs are very smart. Um, we eat pigs, cows, uh, you know, whatever. Um, so, so we already, it is already the case that we don't really set uh set our rules based on intelligence a, a little bit right so so you can get into more trouble doing things to mammals than you can to fish but we you know the, the f f factory farming worldwide tells us that we're not really that as as, as societies we're not really very careful about about um, how, how we, we make that judgment so from from that perspective i think i think there's there's nothing there's nothing to be said about frog skin that you should, we should be talking about, 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 about pigs long before we talk about frog skin. So that, that I think that I, and people, people do get very excited about the Xenobots. Ah, oh, you know, you're, you're using these things and what, okay, but, but start with the, start with the factory farming first, and then we can talk about frog skin. However, however, they raise a much bigger point, which I think we absolutely should be thinking about. Because, because life is so interoperable, meaning that you can make chimeras of different cells from different species and cells will live on inorganic substrates and electrodes and, and everything else. We are inevitably heading for, <clears throat> excuse me, heading for a future where every possible combination of evolved biological material, some sort of synthetic uh, electronic or some other kind of, um, you know, engineered thing and software, every possible combination is going to be explored. We already have cyborgs. We already have people that control wheelchairs and other devices with their mind. People with weird prosthetics. Uh, those prosthetics are going to get weirder and weirder. Somebody's going to, you know, decide that instead of controlling their wheelchair, they'd like to control their vacuum cleaner and maybe their maybe their neighbor's vacuum cleaner and maybe some sort of maybe some sort of lunar, you know, lander. And maybe you want senses that, yeah, sure, you see light, but maybe you'd also like a sense that directly gives you a feeling of where the where the you know the, the stock market is today. We're, we are going to be surrounded by uh, modified organisms, so, so, so hybrids and cyborgs and, and bioengineered animals and plants that uh, it's going to, you know, the, the, the space of possible beings is incredibly vast. And I, I just, we, we, my a postdoc and I just wrote a paper, I'm on the, uh, called Endless Forms Most Beautiful 2.0, right? It's Darwin, Darwin had this phrase and he was like really impressed with a variety of living things that he saw in the natural world. This is an N of one, you know, this, this, this phylogenetic tree on earth is an N of one, basically. We, we are going to be, it's a tiny, if you, if you plot out the space of, of all possible uh, bodies and minds that go with them, everything we know about on earth is like a tiny little corner of that. And there are just massively different creatures that we are going to have to deal with. Never, never mind what happens if, if we find life, you know, exobiological context outside the planet. Never mind that. We're going to be making aliens like you can't believe. That's, that's just, that's just, there's no, there's no getting around that. So that means that um, for the first time, uh, when you encounter some sort of being, you are not going to be able to use familiar touchstones to figure out how to relate to it. Meaning, what did we used to do, right? You, 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 you came across something. But you could you could you could tap it like this, and if you heard a metallic clangy sound, you could conclude many things. Ah, it came off a factory. It's probably pretty boring and dumb, and I'm perfectly within my rights to take this thing apart and remake it into a toaster. 
On the other hand, if you do this and it's sort of soft and furry, you would say, right, it was evolved. It's probably, you know, somewhat clever and I'm going to get in trouble if I'm not nice to it and things like that. Th that's all going to be gone. That, that stuff is not going to survive the next couple of decades in the sense that you, where you, so, so where we're going is a place where what somebody's made of, what literally what materials they're made of, whether it's electronics or, or some combination of, of you know, it's 70% it's human brain cells, 30% uh, uh, electronics, or, or maybe, you know, they got 20% electronics, 10%, some other kind of weird, you know, octopus cells or whatever, what somebody's, somebody's made of and how they got here, meaning evolved, designed, or some combination of the two, is not going to be a good guide to their cognitive capacity. We will not be able to say, well, it kind of looks like a fish. We know what we can do with fish, right? It's, it's, we're, going to be, we're going to be surrounded by things that we have absolutely no clue based on what they look like. Now, Darwin kind of already started us off on that, and, and, and that was a major upheaval. People got upset about that, but that he was saying that, look, there's a smooth continuum between where we are as humans and other life forms that are simpler, but there's no, we're not in the Garden of Eden anymore where you got a bunch of animals and you got a bunch of humans and they're completely different and we can make different rules. So he, he pointed out a one dimensional continuum and people went completely nuts over it and they're still you know, kind, of, kind of crazy about it. That's gonna be nothing compared to what's coming because instead of a single dimensional continuum, we are going to have a, a huge dimensional space of novel beings. And that means that we have to develop an ethics that is basically more grown up than what we have now, which is how did you get here and what are you made of, right? And you know, when, once, when you say that, when you drag that stuff into the light, you can sort of see how childish that is, right? And how, how, how sort of not deep and sort of, you know, uh, how conceptually, and by the way, science fiction has been dealing with this for hundreds of years, right? That, that story is as old as the hills that, you know, this the spaceship lands on your lawn and this thing trundles out and sort of hands you, a, you know, a poem about how happy it is to meet you. And then you're like, well, it's kind of, it's kind of aluminum looking. What do I, uh, you know, what, how do I relate to this thing? And, 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 and what, what, what can I really do with it? So they've been dealing with that for a long time, but the engineering and the biology have gone far ahead, actually, of most of those stories. I mean, this is all reality now. So, yeah. So I, th I think I think there are massive ethical challenges, but they're not what people think they are. It's not really about frog skin. It's about recognizing sentience and figuring out a framework for which I've taken a stab at. By the way, I've, I've um, you know, obviously I don't know the answers to this, but I've taken a stab at a part part of it. Uh, a framework for truly diverse intelligences that that where where you can actually think about how to relate to beings regardless of what they look like or how they got here yeah for sure i mean you, i mean you've already sort of touched on it but like so why do you see the the future of the human species um like i know next 50 100 years and i i guess as well to kind of wrap up a lot of things we've spoken about how would you also foresee the future of like healthcare and treatment yeah, a um, couple of things with respect to, to, to humans. I, I, so somebody asked me once during during an interview like this, somebody asked me, well, given that you think everything is up for, for change, you know, or the organs and, uh, and sensory and whatever, what's a human at that point, right? Like what really is a human? I think that's an excellent question because if you ask yourself, what is it really that I value about another human being? Is it their genetics? No not really is it how they got here oh well i i'm really into the fact that you're a long process of through you know you came by a long process of evolution not really is it is it what your internal organs are made of you know if your spouse went off and came back and said oh man i just had a bunch of internal organs replaced by machine like, whatever fine who cares uh you start to ask yourself well, what is it really that's essential and i think i think that uh my answer would be and, and this is this is based on the um uh, kind of framework that I that I've developed for for comparing diverse intelligences, it's it's your it's the scope of the goals that you're capable of 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 holding on to. So specifically, I would say that a human is a it's a category. What, what you mean when you say human, you you don't mean anything about genetics or or anatomy or anything like that. What you're really saying is capacity for a certain degree of moral concern. You are capable, fundamentally capable of being morally concerned about some number of other beings that's what it means to be minimally human we all know we all know what um diminished capacity is right you go to court and 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 somebody did something horrible and and, and the and the and the and the, the lawyer argues he didn't he, he's got diminished capacity he didn't he wasn't able to to kind of care about what's happening he didn't understand all right we know what diminished capacity is we we should have an idea of what enhanced capacity is someday you, we will have creatures that are so cognitively large 
that they will literally be able to care about massive numbers of individuals the way we can't right we don't have if you know we don't have our linear range so if somebody says uh something happened to uh to some, some, something terrible happened to to a thousand people and then and then they say no actually it was it was you know it was was 50,000 people you don't feel 50 times worse right about it you feel bad but you don't feel 50 times worse we don't have the linear range to literally care about you know we, we're, we're limited in that way someday we may have some sort of uh you know B buddha like uh, uh, uh co cognitive beings that actually can they have a capacity to care and to them we are as limited as uh, some of the creatures we know for example you know dogs and whatnot that you know sure they care about stuff but like a dog is never going to care about what happens in the next town over three weeks from now they just can't their their cognitive light cone is too small for that right so I think uh, that's that's if I had to define a human, that's what I would say. A human is a minimal level of of care and concern for other sentient beings, and 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 you know it, it's a, it's a you know it's a minimal it's a minimal bar. Uh, so what's going to happen? I think that bodies as we know it are going to go out the window. I think humanity in the future is going to be massively diverse, right? Depending on where you live, probably off planet in many cases. Um, and how you live and you, you will choose, you know, when you get old enough, you sort of say, well, you know, I'd like senses that plug me into this and that. And, and, and you know, your, your brother will choose something completely different. And we will all physically, structurally, we will be incredibly diverse. The genetics will become more or less irrelevant. But what still makes us human is that minimal level of, of concern. And if that goes away due to certain changes, then you've become something else. And, you know, that may be good or bad, but it'll be something else. Um, for healthcare, I would say this, the biggest change in healthcare is going to be right now, all of molecular medicine is about the, the, the hardware. It's all about genomic change, uh, protein engineering, pathways, right? All that kind of stuff. That's where computer science was in the 50s. In order to reprogram a computer, you had to physically pull wires, right? You had to physically rewire it. And then what, what happened? Well, you know, why do we have this information technology revolution? Because we figured out that you're much better off programming at the software level. If, you're, if your hardware is good enough, you can't, you can't do that to a, you know, to a mechanical clock. But, but if your hardware is good enough, you can do this. That's what we're going to discover in, in bi biology, in, in biomedicine. We're going, to be, we're going to be addressing the higher control levels. And instead of trying to, I, my, my, my gut feeling is that that's the reason trying to micromanage all of this stuff and we could talk for a long time about why i think that uh instead of trying to micromanage this stuff which is what results in side effects and you know you tweak one thing and something else you know every every drug has a long list of horrible side effects um i think the way to beat all of that is to stop focusing on suppressing the symptoms and try to try to motivate the system to go to a health state and that means understanding how that system traverses its space. What does it want? What can it remember? How intelligent is it? What are the kinds of problems it can solve? What are the things it cares about? Can you train? Can we train organs? Can we train pathways? We, we published a paper recently, and other, other people have too, to show that gene regulatory networks can have six different kinds of learning. So wow. instead, of re, instead of rewiring these things through, uh, through um, uh, uh, gene, gene uh, editing and, and gene therapy, we should have we should have ways of training them and and training them for health states and it's all the advantages of training over micromanagement that you have when you you know when you train a rat to do a trick instead of having to go in there and run every neuron like a like a like a puppet to get it to do what it wants to do right much easier to train the thing so i think i think where where medicine is is going to go i hope is towards a, uh, understanding the high level control structures and actually resolving whatever the problem is as opposed to trying to uh, address individual uh, individual symptoms, which is kind of what we have, right? Most most drugs, ex except for antibiotics and things like that, most drugs that we have, you stop taking it, you're back where you get, they don't fix anything, they, right? You stop taking it, you're back where you came from. They don't actually change the system at all. So so I think, I think we're going to get past that. Yeah, and I, I think as we've spoken about, we've seen yeah, multiple examples now where it seems like having this high-level um, interferent, interferent interfering at the high level seems to and not worrying about the micromanagement seems to be like a more effective um way forward and I think just kind of on from that obviously I trained as a biochemist looking at the very lower levels and the molecular details what kind of advice would you give for um I guess my viewers who are probably also fascinated by your your research in terms of uh like having a career in science now what is the best way to kind of understand 
have a broad knowledge in different disciplines, which uh, uh, like inevitably seems to be required to understand whatever this higher level is and the, 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 the downstream manifestations. And I guess just more generally advice and having an amazing scientific career, as you've, you've de definitely demonstrated. Um, yeah, I can, I can, I can say a couple of things. I, I mean, really, I, uh, I'm kind of amazed every day that that I'm here doing these things. I, I, I dreamed about it from the time I was a kid, but I pretty much always, I pr pretty much always thought that it would, it would you, like, all through grad school, for example, I thought today's the day I get kicked out like that. Like, I pretty much thought this, this, this was it, and I'll go back to programming and whatever. Um, so, so it's not like I had, you know, it's not like I knew uh, how to do this from from the beginning. So there's a lot of uh, events that uh, that took place, but. Um, I will I will say this. Uh, what's really key to remember is that every that the disciplines are not real and that and what I mean by that is that every discipline is pretty sure of various assumptions and the right ways to look at things. And what you have to do is really nail home the idea that that's just one lens. Every department, every set of people with their own journal and their own funding body and their own conferences, they're all using one lens to look at things and they love that lens. And if you go there and try to do it in a different way, they'll tell you that you're nuts. And there may be somebody next door who's using a different lens to whom everything you're saying is obvious. I see that that happens to me all the time. I give a talk and different parts of the talk make people mad depending on what, uh, what department I'm in. There are things that I can say in one department and they're like, yeah, so of course. And then in another department, what are you crazy? So, right. So, so you just have to realize that you, sh you, you, if you really want to uh, do new things, and I think we're getting to the point as a society where all the stuff that could have been done with a single lens is pretty much done, right? We've we're kind of all the easy things that could have been solved from a single perspective. I think they're mostly solved. Everything that's which is a my which is a, a far minority of the things that need to be solved. Everything else needs 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 you to crack out of that lens and use multiple approaches that are informed by different ways of looking at the world. So computer scientists, physicists, uh, biologists, uh, cognitive scientists at, at all levels, right? Uh, they all they all look at the world in a completely different way, and we just need to. I think we need to commit to all of those may or may not be useful. So just be ready to try them out and discard them as you will and get really comfortable with those, with those kinds of lenses. So, so take some, not, not, not computational biology or bioinformatics, but real honest to God computer science classes, right? Take an engineering class where the most magical class, by the way, of all is, is, is electrical engineering 101 because you start with, you start with Ohm's law and like the stupid, you know, the electrons running through a wire and by the end of the class, you've built a decision-making device that can follow an algorithm. You make a little computer that takes instructions off a stack. It does logic. It's following an algorithm. You started with physics. You ended up with 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 logic and and uh, you know and a thing that 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 reads information and follows instructions. And you did it with your own hands. So you know there wasn't any magic. It, it, it's an, it, it, like incredible, right? So so those kinds of ways to to think about things, you know, or or physicists, you know. Um, and the way that the way that they like to have explanations, you know, f f f equals m a, right? That kind of explanation would never fly in a molecular biology class. They 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 hate that kind of stuff. But but for a physicist, that's a great that's a great explanation. So uh, computer science, especially, right? And 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 their emphasis on um, um, a, a multiple realizability and the fact that 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 the algorithm is the key. And it doesn't matter if you're made of you know of, of 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 silicon and and you know electron flows or like dan dan says beer cans and string it doesn't matter so so all of those perspectives so so that's what that's what i that's what i think i think it's really important to just realize that everything you've been taught by a certain set of people is is all from one perspective and that things that they believe are are are, are you know sort of sacred like all your explanations should be at the level of chemistry right that's, I mean, what is, what is, that's not even, that's not even reductionism. If you, if you were a real reductionist, you'd want to do it in terms of quantum foam, but you don't want to do that. You want chemistry. So, so, right. So, so every field has these, these things that they hold on to. And I think, I think uh, we're, we're, we're rapidly getting to the place where progress means you've got to, you got to try on some new, some new lenses. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. That's some incredible advice. <clears throat> and obviously having read a lot of your research, it really has like introduced me to a lot of concepts that I'd never heard of before. And like it now, 
as you say, it makes me think about things differently because I've been like so trained. I mean, I don't want to say anything bad about my education, but like you do certain, um, you do put these lenses on how you think about a certain subject. And I think it is important to, yeah, have that sort of diverse understanding. So um, we've had an absolutely incredible conversation. And so um, where can my viewers go to find out more about your lab research or to um, yeah, find out about yeah, more what you're doing? Yeah, um, everything is at, uh, is at, a, is at a website, uh, drmike11.org. So there, there's links to the various institutes, so like the ICDO, our Institute for Computer Designed Organisms, which is all the Xenobot stuff, all the papers, all the primary papers, a bunch of talks uh, that I've given. Um, every, everything is there. It's pretty, it's pretty up to date. All the papers, all the, you know, every, every, everything is there. Lots of material. So, oh, and I also have a Twitter feed, a Twitter feed at drmike11. I just also have to say it's excellent to follow. Um, you have, oh, as I can see in the background, an amazing, uh, you have collection of books which as well as I would love to be able to read them all at some point but yeah um me too me too it's time to read it's time to read it's time to reread I mean many of these I read 30 40 years ago and I you know you, you you look at them and you say wow I wonder if I would squeeze something completely different out of it now so mm. yeah. and if sure, I mean I was actually just reading a paper um this one that's relevant to my PhD work uh, for the first time in like two years and even just two years I've now thought something very different from it than I did the yeah. first time so yeah, yeah, like anyway, I got distracted. Thank you so much for uh, yeah taking the time to speak with me today, and I wish the best of best of luck uh, for your research, and I look forward to seeing your latest discoveries. Likewise, yeah, thanks so much. Good luck with everything. Keep in touch. Yeah, be in touch.